Hey everybody, welcome back. This is lecture number 10. We're at the milestone. We're going to talk about artificial neural networks today and specifically about mostly about the perceptron. And along the way, I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. I'm going to kind of get into the cognitive science and history end of things. Because after all, this may be about machine learning, but we are teaching it in the CogSci department. So we'll get a little bit more kind of context and uh, thinking about biology than we normally get into in this class. Uh, before we get into that, I do have a little bit of business to conduct. So uh, as several people have pointed out this week, there is some conflicting late policy information out there. Now, I thought I had it all set up and it was just in the syllabus, but Little did I realize that a late policy copied over from a previous, uh, previous course, previous version of this course taught by somebody else, by, by Zhao Wen Tu, it, uh, it ended up being inside the actual homeworks for some reason. So, all right, since uh, Zhao Wen's policy is much more lenient than mine, we will just let that one roll. So it's going to be the old policy, the one that's on the homework, 5% off for the first day late, and then 10% off for each additional day late afterwards. Okay, I will change the syllabus to reflect this in the next day or two, but this will be the official policy for the homeworks that are past and for the future. Another thing I want to kind of raise that people are getting concerned about is uh, participation grades. I, I really want to make it clear that participation grades are not something that you are going to have to worry about. If you do anything at all, really, you're going to get participation points, okay? So the amount of worry and bother that I see coming out of various places, uh, you know, if you spent that uh, amount of effort in actually, I don't know, uh, working a few extra problems or doing some extra reading, you would get much better results than worrying about the last little point of discussion or Piazza participation, okay? Trust me, I'm not going to grade this stuff harsh. Um, really, the whole point of participation is just to encourage you to engage with the material, right? And uh, so in much more important terms, uh, we have our first exam coming up. Midterm one is on the 30th of October. That is a week from today. Um, so next week is going to be study. There's not going to be any homework at all, but we are going to hand out example test problems for you to work on. You won't get a grade for doing it, but it will set you up for exactly the kind of knowledge that you will need for the exam. We will also be running reviews in lecture and also in the discussion next week. Okay, and then that's that. Let's do some exciting stuff. So, cognitive science, right? So all this machine learning stuff, it kind of has a very interesting relationship with studying the brain. So in some cases, machine learning algorithms have grown out of our attempts to study how biological minds work. And oftentimes when they, when that, that metaphor or bit of insight leaves biology and goes to the mathematics and computer end of things, it gets developed into a highly um, useful theory, something where the math gets figured out, we get guarantees about when we can be right with this kind of a model and stuff like that. Then at a certain point, sometimes it comes back and it reflects onto biology again, where our, our, our methods of technology can influence how we understand biology, right? So for instance, Everybody's probably pretty familiar with the idea of talking about the brain as if it's a computer, right? This is just a metaphor because obviously the neurons don't actually compute with silicon. They're not actually, 
transistors in any sense, either physically or phenomenologically. They don't actually just switch on and off ones and zeros. Memory in a computer works very, very different than memory in your head, right? In memory in a computer, you store it, and until you lose power, it's, it's there forever exactly the way you left it. Memories in your head are very malleable, and you don't actually recall exactly what happened to you. You recall some gist or overall sense of what happened to you, and the details may be wrong, and they may change with uh, recollection. So when you think about a memory and remember something that happened to you, it's quite likely that that act of remembering will actually alter the memory. Okay? Computers don't work like this. There's a bunch of other ways in which we can get into this deal. But fundamentally, what I'm getting at is that the technology that we're used to, the metaphors we're used to working in, can affect how we understand things that, like the mind, okay? So, for instance, a couple of hundred years ago, the high technology was steam engines, right? All these gears and, you know, pistons moving up and down and valves and pipes. Well, guess what? At the turn of the 20th century, do you know what the popular metaphors were for understanding the mind? Valves, right? Or just a little bit later, as the telegraph started to come in, then it was telegraph wires. And a little bit later than that, it went into um, this kind of stuff, right? So by the 40s or so, when we started to have electronics, they were starting to become the dominant technology. Then people started to think about the mind as working as a bunch of electronic switches. Now, switches in these days were kind of cool. These vacuum tubes actually are also known as valves because this was a carryover from the previous technology metaphor. Because like a valve, vacuum tubes can be ones or zeros. They can turn on or turn off. And this is what we had until the transistor made its appearance, which is what we built computers out of nowadays, on and off, one and zero, right? Um, so by this point in like the, uh, you know, up to the middle part of the 20th century, we were building technology that looked a lot like this. And as this went on and on, and we developed, you know, unlike the previous revolutions with the steam and so forth, the electronics revolution developed quite a lot of math. And the advantage of that was that now that we had a metaphor that we were going to talk about the brain as if it was a piece of electronics, we now had a bunch of math to back that up. And we started to be able to use that math as a way to understand the way the brain works. All right, so I am setting the stage for the 1940s when this guy, Norbert Wiener, or Weiner, or depends on how German you are feeling, um, he kind of basically single-handedly created a field that became, or at least highly inspired, the computational approach to understanding the brain that we have today. It also kind of kick-started a bunch of things in uh, electrical engineering control systems theory, and a whole bunch of stuff. So his ideas were fundamentally about feedback control, right? So he called his theory cybernetics. It's a not very long book. It's certainly worth your read if you're a cognitive science person interested in computational models of the brain. Um, and the fundamental gist of it is that when you, um, when you look at organisms. Most of what they're doing is they're trying to maintain themselves. They're trying to keep in some sort of steady state, okay? If you get very, very hungry, well, your body's going to make you go out and find some food to maintain your metabolism. When your, uh, you know, various biological processes get disturbed, they try to go back to what's called homeostasis. They try to go back to the place that they started. And that kind of impulse uh, 
to homeostasis, this impulse to make sure that everything just continues on the way it used to, is in uh, Wiener's conception, the fundamental nature of adaptive intelligent behavior. Okay, And so when you have some sort of input and you have some sort of output, and you have something in the middle that does stuff with it, the way in which you keep things going is by having a feedback loop, okay? When the, when the, feed, when the uh, outputs aren't what they should be, okay? If the outputs are bad, then that signal travels along this way and it causes a, a change here. We're like, we're not hitting our target. So we've got we've to change what we're doing, okay? This is feedback control systems is a fundamental part of a lot of modern signal processing and electrical engineering kind of things. And it's fundamental to the way we think about minds. All right. So another thing that was happening during this time was uh, the early attempts at robotics. Um, and again, these were coming from the standpoint of little electric circuits that we could make that were imitating biological functions. So Gray Walter was a, uh, a neurologist in Britain, and he, as a hobby, built these little robots in the 50s, and uh, very early 50s, actually. And he built these robots, and they would do things like follow lights around and go towards each other and bump off of things and find a new location to go after bumping off of something. And they looked alive. It's worth your while to take a little trip down YouTube, which I can't do for you right now, and have a, have a look at the, the video clips that exist of Gray Walter's turtles. They're pretty amusing. Okay? Well, all of that brings us to understanding the mind and these early models of neural networks. So before I get into that, it's worth just reminding people who uh, may not remember that what is a neuron well it's a cell in the body which is which essentially functions as a chemical pump okay but in pumping chemicals in and out it creates electrical potentials so neurons have these uh, input regions that are called dendrites okay so signals come into a neuron here and the signals, once they start to push chemicals around inside a neuron and outside a neuron, create electrical potentials. And the electrical potentials will fly from the dendrites, the input regions, to the neuron's cell body, and then down the axons, which is the output. So things only go down in axon generally. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. But uh, signals go down in axon and then they go to the next neuron in the chain where those electrical impulses get converted into a chemical signal which jumps across the gap and creates another electrical impulse in the postsynaptic neuron, okay? There are chemical electrical machines and they work as a signal jumps across this gap. This is the synapse and some synapses are more powerful than others. Some synapses will definitely make the next neuron in the chain go boom. Some are weaker and they might with a small probability make it go and some are weaker still and there's no way this one firing here could drive the next neuron in the chain. You need a lot of neurons, all active, all coming in and hitting this one neuron and then the concerted effort of all of those signals is enough to make the next neuron in the chain go boom. Okay? So, like I was saying, we have Wiener starting some pretty awesome stuff in the late 40s, and uh, some of the people that he brought into his orbit were uh, McCulloch and Pitts. So Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. And they created this little doodad here, which has been cited over 20,000 times. Um, 
which is the idea that you could look at neurons as switches. So even though we know now that they're basically a lot more uh, expressive than just on or off, uh, at the time they weren't sure of that. And by making the simplification, McCulloch and Pitts were able to cast neurons essentially as elements in logic. So if you think about your, maybe you've had a computer engineering class or you've started, you know, done some architecture things, you understand what a logic gate is, okay? So they wanted to think of neurons as logic gates, right? So if this neuron and this neuron are firing, well, then it can cause this neuron to fire. And that looks a lot like an and, this and that. Um, they were also uh, interested in much more complex and more biological things than that actually happened. So very rarely is something this simple in the brain, as I'll show you in a second. But it often has these kinds of uh, recurrent connections and more crazy connectivity than you can possibly imagine. But their contribution was to make neurons look like elements of logic. And logic is something that people at the time were very interested in using to model how intelligence happens. Okay. So now let's say we have a neuron here. What is it that it's doing by the McCulloch and Pitts method? Well, it's summing up inputs. So there's a bunch of synapses arriving and each one has a different strength. Okay. So we have this W vector, which you know, is determining the strength of signals coming in. So inputs multiplied by weights, summed up, and then it goes through some sort of nonlinearity. In, in uh, most of the things we're talking about, it's just going to be a threshold. So you sum up this value, and if that value is uh, less than so much, then we get a zero output. And if the value is higher than a certain threshold, then you get a something out, a one, because McCulloch Pitts neurons are either zero or one. Okay. So as I mentioned, they were interested in couching these as logic gates. So in that conception, right, if, uh, if I draw that little uh, neuron body again, right, so we have these synapses coming on. If your threshold, if your weights are one, all right, so having both incoming signals on gives you a two on the summation, right? And if that's the case, then two being greater than 1.5, if we set threshold to 1.5, we can get an AND gate essentially, right? If we set these values, weight one, 1 and 1 1.5, then a neuron can operate like an AND gate. For those of you that have seen your circuit diagram. Sorry, I did that backwards, AND. All right, and you can do an OR gate just as easily. So by setting your threshold to 0 0.5, that means anything that turns on here is going to turn on the output. And so we get an effective logical OR. Okay. And so on and so forth. We can do NOT, we can do anything. Because you can build AND, OR, and NOT, we know that a network of neurons could potentially be Turing complete. That is, they can compute any computable function. Okay, because it's been proven that as long as you have and, or, and not, you can compute anything that's computable. Okay, so where have these things gone since then? Well, nowadays we live in this world with neural networks. So this is like kind of, remember, this is like the 1950 uh, version of what our idea of what neurons look like. Uh, this is maybe more of our 1970 idea right? But this is kind of what current neural networks look like in 
an artificial neural network sense in the sense that these are what machine learning algorithms look like. So the machine learning algorithm methods that we're going to talk about are highly developed by now, but they are not, um, they are not the state of the art in neuroscience research. Okay. Cause this is what biological neural networks look like much messier than that thing I just showed you. Right. So each one of these colored things is a cell with a neural cell with its body and its dendrites and axons reaching all over the place. Um, this is the kind of picture that's made from reconstructing uh, through slices of tissue. So they, um, they basically usually freeze a brain and then they slice it super thin with a diamond knife and you get a little slice and you put it on a microscope and you can see like these little voids and cavities are cell bodies and you know the axons and then you slice 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 and then you try to connect all those slices and figure out the path of a neuron through this dense area and it's crazy and it just shows you how simple an artificial neural network is compared to the real biological kind okay well what we're going to talk about today really is a simple early network after McCulloch pits, but before modern neural networks and kind of the grand parent, I will say, of modern neural networks. So the perceptron is what we're talking about. And from this uh, lovely little bit of uh, fundamentally self-promotion and overhype um, that was in the New York Times Sunday edition in 1958, we can get an idea that uh, Frank Rosenblatt, the, the person who was responsible for this, um, thought a lot of his invention. He thought, for instance, that, um, let's see if I can find it here. He thinks that it would be the first thing to think, the first electronic device to think as the human brain. He compares it to a human brain right off the bat, right? Um, the Navy is promising to build these thinking machines, right? They'll be able to read and write. They will be able to, you know, walk and talk and even be conscious. So uh, there's a fair amount of hype train going on here. Um, it's worth your read at some point. So what was this perceptron? Well, that. <laughs> Those electronics that we were looking at earlier, those valves, uh, you know, vacuum tubes and soldering gun stuff. And the whole idea behind it was that the perceptron was able to, after being presented with a visual input that went into a camera and the camera's pixels got turned into representations that went into this neural network, it was asked, is the picture on the left or on the right side of the field, of the image? So if this C here was on the left side or the right side of the camera's field of view, and if it was right, then yay. And if it was wrong, it got a signal that no, you are wrong. And that's supervised learning, ladies and gentlemen. And that signal was used to change the weights of the neural network, as we'll discuss right now. Okay. So once again, what we've got is a McCulloch Pitts style neuron, just one essentially. So we have these inputs coming in from various places. We have one neuron that's summing up all of these and the result of that sum up is going through a nonlinearity, a threshold nonlinearity, and it's producing an output, which is either left or right. Okay, and of note, all of this is a neuron. Okay, or at least I should say a mathematical model of a neuron and a very 1950s model of a neuron at that. 
Now critical here is this part, right? So McCulloch Pitts already showed us that you can do stuff like that if you sit down and carefully engineer the weights by hand. The real contribution of Rosenblatt was that he made a system which in the tradition of Norbert Wiener has a feedback loop. It's a feedback control system. And when the output does not match the desired result, this error term comes back here and it changes the weights. By changing the weights, we get the algorithm to do what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now more to the point, Rosenblatt's perceptron was not just one of these neurons, because I was kind of showing you this thing right here, but it was a bunch of them all together. And they were going to operate in different parts of the visual field. But fundamentally, each one of these is its own separate beast, because uh, in the original conception of Perceptron, there was no like, you know, sideways talk between the different Perceptron neurons. So these are all just a bunch of independent Perceptrons, and we can look at just one of these without losing the generality of how the whole thing works. All right. So actually, I want to go back because I want to point out this right? This is the sum up operation expressed as matrix math. Sum up all of the weights, each one of the weights times each one of the inputs, right? So if this is x1, it's x1 times weight 1 plus, oh, whoops, my bad. <laughs> x1 times weight 1, that's the bias term there. x2 times w2, so on and so forth into a sum, right? This is the matrix algebra version of that same thing, okay? And we recognize that because that's just a line, right? We've done this several times now. So we know just by looking at it that the perceptron is a linear discriminant. It's going to draw a line and Everything on one side of the line is going to be a output value of 1, and everything on the other side of the line is going to be an output value of 0. So a perceptron can do any kind of operation that you can do by drawing a line on the graph. Okay? So for instance, this is an AND, and this is an OR. Okay? So the AND operation, you just set the threshold so that as long as you have both of these on, then you get on that side, right? This is 1 and 1 puts you over here, and that's on the correct side to get an AND out. And if you only have one of them on and not the other, then, you know, you're not going to fire. And here is the OR operation. You set the threshold so that if either of these two are true, or both, then you get a firing. Now what about this case on the far right? I'm going to give you a minute to think, can you draw a line, just one line, that separates the black from the white dots? So this is called an exclusive OR. An exclusive OR is this, but not that. This, but not that. So an, it's an OR minus the AND part, OK? So it won't fire when there's an AND situation on, but only if it's one or the other. Right, and that you cannot do. You cannot draw one single line that separates the white from the black. So a perceptron cannot do an exclusive OR either. And that was what ended up causing what is often been called the AI winter. Dun, dun, dun! So um, these guys, Minsky and Papert, they... Uh, so Minsky and Rosenblatt were kind of friends and kind of enemies, kind of frenemies. And Minsky was continually writing uh, Rosenblatt. And 
um, he wrote this book, which was kind of like, hey, look at all these things perceptrons can do. But it also had these parts, which was like, hey, look at these things it can't do. Like exclusive or. And to be doubly fair, um, you know, Minsky was uh, making a hyper simplification of what Rosenblatt's conception of the perceptron was, but he was writing a bunch of clear math about what could or could not be done with this simplified version of perceptron. Okay, so at any rate, this caused some havoc. Um, and I mean, it's, this book is commonly credited, although maybe it might have had something to do also with the ridiculous overclaiming uh, that Rosenblatt was doing. But this book is often credited with uh, killing off research into neural networks for the next roughly 20 years. Okay, but again, I personally think that kind of blame assigning is a little bit much because I think Rosenblatt's, uh, you know, hype machine was at least part of the problem. So let's get nitty gritty with the algorithm. We've got some inputs X. We've got some weights W. We've got a bias term B. And the perceptron's transfer function, its nonlinearity is, it's going to throw a plus one if Wx plus B, sorry, don't want that, if Wx plus B is greater than some threshold. And otherwise, it's going to throw us an off signal. Okay, it's a binary classifier, very similar to the things we've already been working. Okay, so the classifier is a function of x1, in this case is x1, x2, right? So we're going to have a w1, w2 because it's in two dimensions. And we've got a bias. So remember that is really just the sine function that we were talking about as the transfer function. It's also known as. So what we're going to do is, uh, you know, draw a line through here defined by that w, defined by that uh, normal vector, just like a discriminant. Okay. So how does the algorithm actually work? First, we initialize the weights. Choose either small random values or zeros, something like that. Get a data point. Compute the output from the, you know, the forward thing there. So that's the y is equal to mx plus b bit. And do the classification. If things are good, great. Ignore it. If your prediction makes the same result as the learning uh, label, you're good. But if it's not, then you need to update the weights using this perceptron learning rule. Okay. And this learning rule is that the weight so it's an iterative algorithm. The weight at this time step gets some stuff added to it to make the weight at the next time step. This is also true for the bias. The bias at this time step gets this added to it to get the bias at the next time step. Okay, so what is this stuff? Well, this is the target desired output, and this is the real output. Okay? And... Uh, this is, of course, the inputs them coming in. Okay, so this part here will look very familiar to you. That's an error term. Okay, that's the difference between what we actually did and what we wanted to do. Okay, you can write this super simply in Python. I just went out found a couple of implementations and I simplified them down for you, right? So this function is a class-based thing. Don't worry too much about that if you're not a Python class person. So we just have to set everything up by initializing the various parameters, threshold, learning rate, and the weights, okay? In this case, we're gonna make the weights zero. Well, when we want to do a bit of training, we're going to use this learning rule, right? And you can see right here, you can see exactly the same thing happening. Here's the weights are plus equal to a learning rate. So 
that's something that could be on the front there, times the target value minus the output, times the inputs. Okay, and another thing that you would note is that this transfer function, this nonlinearity, is plus one if we go so that the inputs multiplied, so dot product of the weights and the inputs plus b is greater than zero. Well, here's the dot product of the weights and the inputs. Okay, and if it's bigger than some threshold, turn on. Okay, when does the perceptron work? Well, there are mathematical guarantees that it will converge for a linearly separable problem. But two things are wrong with that, right? First off, uh, because it's got this bang-bang control, so it's, you know, it moves the weights when things don't match, right? Um, it's not necessarily going to do it smoothly and quickly, okay? It's not necessarily going to produce a good separator either. So you could end up, whoops, you know, if we have... So we might draw a separator line, like a really good one might be something, I don't know, by your eye like that. And, you know, we could also get ones that look like this. Now one of those look like it might be a, a little bit more stable and generalizable, right? We generally would prefer this one over here because it looks like we might be less likely to make a mistake with a new data set. Whereas this one running right close to the edge there, who knows, maybe, maybe we would get another data point right over here. Okay? So it's clearly going to get a good, it's clearly going to get a separator. It's not necessarily going to get a good one. And uh, the linear separator is not uniquely defined because if you train it on the same data over again, but you shuffle the order of the inputs, then you could get a different output. You could get a different result. Okay, so one key insight is that we can recast this perceptron learning algorithm we just showed you, which is ad hoc. It was just kind of put together. It wasn't based upon anything, but we can recast it as gradient descent. Let me show you how, okay? So we have our perceptron algorithm, right? The transfer function is right here. Oops. So our linear equation, and if the result of that is positive, then we say, yes, it's the positive class. Okay, just like always, we have our training set, we have our outputs. We can define a loss function that looks like this. So we take the maximum value of either zero. So let me, let me draw a line through here just so it's very clear. We either take zero, or we take minus y sub i times wtx plus b. All right, what is all that? Well, this part you'll recognize as just the transfer function, and this is, of course, our desired outputs. So this is the target times the prediction. Well, that's interesting, because remember, we're labeling in plus one and minus one. So, if the target and the prediction are the same, if our prediction is good, it matches what it should, then two negatives, negative one, negative one is going to be there, or two positive ones are going to be there, positive one, positive one. Either way, the end result of this is going to be plus one, okay? Now, if on the other hand they don't match, if one of them is a positive one and the other one is a negative one, then a no match will give us a minus one. 
So we can see there the multiplication of the target by the prediction gives us the error term immediately. But what's interesting is that we're going to take the biggest value. We're going to take the max of either this, which is a plus one or a minus one, or zero. Aha! Now we're ready. Okay, what does it look like? You draw it on a graph. Well, in the case where things match, we're going to get a positive one. Okay, and a positive one going through a minus sign there makes a negative one. Sorry, I should use the highlighter. So don't forget this negative sign right here. So a positive one for a match is generated right here. We take the negative of it. Well, what is the maximum value, zero or minus one? It's zero, right? So everything where we match is going to be zero all the way through here. It's always going to be that zero is bigger than anything over here if target times prediction are the same thing. We'll get, okay? Well, when it doesn't match, when this becomes a minus one over here in the y times uh, the prediction, then we apply the negative sign and then minus one becomes a positive one. Positive one is bigger than zero, duh. So we end up with this. So as the prediction gets further and further away from the actual target value, then we're going to go up, up, up. All right. So this is known as the hinge loss. It's called the hinge loss because it looks like a door hinge, right? It's going All right, so this is the non-match zone. Okay, so this all this stuff is our um, loss function, right? So this is loss function. What is the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights? Well, the only, you know, so uh, we're going to get a um, piecemeal derivative here. So this is you know, for the case where everything matches, right, when y of i equals to the sign, we can see right here, what's the derivative of this curve right here? It's a horizontal line, so its derivative is a horizontal line, so its derivative is zero, right? So for the case where things match, the derivative is zero. Nothing happens. The weights don't change. Now, when we're in this zone, on the other hand, the derivative is clearly going to be a constant slope just by graphical inspection. What is it mathematically? Well, we're going to be deriving this part of it, right? So this part of it, the derivative with respect to w, is going to be x of i times y sub i. The b part drops out because there's no w over there on that term, right? Okay, so that's how we get minus y sub i x of i is the derivative right here. And the way we get zero besides graphically is the derivative right here. Okay. So let me just go ahead over here. So the hinge loss why are we doing this? Why are we replacing the original loss function with this hinge loss thing? Because that's what we're doing. To do gradient descent, right, the, the original perceptron had this kind of a setup. It was like, if we are wrong, if the target's minus output is an error term, 
then we're going to change things by a delta. We have a threshold nonlinearity, right? So this is called a zero one loss. And the zero one loss has no gradients except where it goes to infinity. So, right, the tangent line here is zero, and the tangent line here is zero, and here the tangent line is infinity. So that's not very good for doing anything gradient wise. Um, so this, this hinge loss approximates the situation, right? When the case where y sub i is exactly equal to one, sorry, where uh, y sub i is negative one and the output, the prediction is a positive one, then we're gonna get this situation right here, which instantaneously, you know, if you just have zeros or ones, right, you, you're actually kind of recapitulating the zero one loss but you're doing it with a mathematical construct, which is derivable. Okay. All right. So, right. Let me go back because that was actually worth showing that I just forgot to. Right, so this is why the perceptrons um, Well, that's annoying. I can't undo my erasure now. Um, but this is why, right? So the derivative of the sine is why we end up with a zero one loss, right? And we've already talked our way through the derivative of the hinge loss. Right. So, the hinge loss gets us gradient feedback, and uh, it's going to be, you know, much better than trying to find the infinity place in the zero one loss. So we replace zero one loss by something much more relaxed in terms of its gradient. Um, so the perceptron is updating single samples, right? We get a sample in, we update with it, we go to the next sample. And that's different than gradient descent because gradient descent typically takes all the samples, batches them together, calculates the gradient, and then goes on that. Okay? So this is where a gradient descent version of the perceptron can be seen. Okay? So remember gradient descent is summing up all of the elements all at once to calculate the gradient and that's different than the update rule, okay? Um, if you can see here, right, we've, uh, the derivative of the loss comes in this form. And if you look at the rule for the perceptron, this is the perceptron's iterative learning rule, the one Rosenblatt wrote down here on the bottom, okay? We can see that putting this derivative in there means that if we set lambda equal to two, the two cancels out that one half and we end up, sorry, the negative two cancels out the negative one half and we end up with this. So the exact form of the um, perceptron learning rule can be found by using this setting this learning rate parameter of uh, gradient descent to two. Okay, and we can do the exact same thing. That last slide was the weights. This slide is the bias term. Obviously we could collapse the bias term into the weights and then we wouldn't have all this whole extra step, but we're following a certain notation here. So the same deal, set, set lambda equal to two and you can go from the gradient descent version to the perceptron uh, iterative learning rule version. Okay, so just to summarize, here's our perceptron. It outputs plus one or minus one according to whether something is a positive or a negative example of whatever it's trying to classify. Takes those data points x, 
and generates those predictions. And if those, if those predictions, the output does not match the target, we're going to update stuff. And if they match, then this term goes to a zero, right? And we're going to update things proportional to the inputs themselves. The bias term doesn't have a proportional to the inputs, the bi or it does, right? It's proportional to the bias term, which is one. So, you know, who cares? All right, so we're basically there, right? We can implement this by showing you a numerical example like we've been wont to do recently, okay? So we have some positive samples and some negative samples. And let's just operate on a single one of these guys, okay? So we need to draw a decision boundary based upon our sampling of these data points. So we're going to choose... Okay, sorry. We have to start with random initial weights, right? So we're going to choose random initial weights that are going to be 2 and minus 2, okay? So these are our random weights, 1, 2, and minus 2, okay? And they define this line that we've drawn here in red. So random initial small weights, okay? Now we get to operate on one of the data points. We're going to choose randomly one of these points, okay? So we're going to go for 3, 2, all right? So it has a ground truth of minus 1. It's a gray dot, okay? Let's see what we predict. So we take 3, 2, we run it through our thresholded function there. And what we get out is these numbers. I am not going to walk you through this basic math. You have the possibility to press play, and I am super late at night right now. So, so it turns out when you run that math, you can verify for yourself, we get 5 as the sum up, which is definitely bigger than the threshold. So we get a plus one and oops, it's a minus one. So they do not match. So we have to generate an update. Okay. So we have to change those weights. Well, let's propagate it all through. So here's our updating rate, our updating rule. We can plug in those numbers. And those are going to change the weights to these new values, minus 5, minus 2, and the bias becomes minus 4. Well, what happens to our line? Oh, it gets drawn very differently now. Okay, we can keep going. We're going to need to do another round of this. We're going to choose... Uh, we're going to choose minus 3, 1 this time, right? So again, minus 3, 1 gets plugged now into this new set of weights. These are not the weights we started out with. We update the weights after every single try, okay? So this is why we get different results when we go through the points in different order, because if we went through the points here to here, we would have a different weight when we're processing this one than if we go from here to here to there. Okay, so at any rate, we get numbers. You can plug them in. It turns out in this case that they match, that we have a plus one and a plus one. Okay, so no weight updates. So we keep the same line, and now we process this point, one minus two. It doesn't work. We have we get a mismatch and we have to update again. So we're going to iterate until we converge on one particular place. Okay. And eventually we're going to converge after going through all of these, perhaps multiple times, we're going to converge on a linear separator that successfully separates the positive and negative classes.
Okay, so this is our final algorithm. Right on the left hand side is the actual perceptron learning rule. On the right is our updated hinge loss version of gradient descent that matches that rule. Okay. It's important to note that this is not strictly gradient descent. So again, gradient descent we calculate on everything at once. All the bat all the data in the training set. In this we're iteratively doing it one by one. So this is a process that's known as stochastic gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent is super powerful. Stochastic gradient descent is the way most deep learning neural networks work, or they use an in-betweener in between stochastic and regular gradient descent called mini batch. Okay, so what's the difference between stochastic and regular old batch based gradient descent? Well, I've said it before, right, that this this guy takes all the data at once and this one does this data point and then this data point and this data point and this data point and at least in this little toy convex uh, error surface you can see that it's going to take a very different path when you do stochastic versus when you do plain old gradient descent and that's relatively true for things that gradient descent can be calculated on it's going to go to the uh, minima more quickly than stochastic version of the of the thing okay and as i mentioned the random order of the updates means you can take different paths so if we restarted all of this then maybe the next path would be like this okay just because we did the same data points in a different order now a key difference is that this one can be done online. So if you're processing data, doing learning on something that's coming to you one by one, like say you're training on something which is time-based and you can't get all the data because it's still arriving now and the next hours and the next hours and the next hours, then this is an algorithm which is good for that kind of online work. Whereas a regular old gradient descent is a batch, you have to have all the data you're going to operate on first. So you can't do this live machine learning kind of process. Another advantage of stochastic is that you can subsample. So big deep learning problems especially, they're like, eh, we've got too much data. I'm just going to grab a small subsample of it and want to train on this. And as long as I sample well out of the bigger data, I'm going to be relatively efficient and it's going to be much, much faster for me. Okay. So just to finish out, um, we've been talking about a perceptron, right? Just one of those. And you remember how Minsky and Papert showed that a single one of these perceptrons was no good for some kinds of problems because it couldn't solve things like the exclusive or which was not linearly separable well when neural networks came back from their long winter um, there was it it developed in part because there were a whole bunch of new mathematical formulations that showed that when you start stacking perceptrons up right into multiple layers, then you can get back all that representational power. Okay, so everything that a single perceptron can't do, a multi-layer perceptron with multiple layers can. In fact, multiple layer perceptrons are universal function approximators. It's been shown, uh, you know, and proved that any function you can write you can approximate with a multi-layer perceptron. So the thing is, is that to do multiple layers, you have a special problem, okay? The gradient descent we've been doing, right? Taking the gradient of the loss function and using the loss. So here's the outputs, the output layer. 
So we know what the values of that should be. We have the training labels. So we can get the, the gradient on the loss function, and we can change these weights according to that, right? So these weights, we can gradient descent. The thing is, is that we now need to figure out a way to take the credit for these, for these weights and, and send the credit for back into earlier sections of the neural network. And that is called the back propagation algorithm, where we assign the credit for this goodness or badness out here to this weight down here. We have to propagate the credit all the way through the network, through all the different paths. So some of it's going to come this way, and some of it's going to come this way to help us understand why this weight right here uh, should change, how it should change. Okay, that is a topic for a different class. We are not going to cover multiple layer perceptrons and backpropagation here, but uh, that is, of course, the basis not just for multi-layer perceptrons, but multi-multi-multi-multi-layer perceptrons, which they decided to call deep neural networks at a certain point. Okay? So all this stuff really is just that super buzzword deep learning that everybody loves nowadays. Um, and that is a story, like I said, for if you take uh, Zhaowen's... Um, deep learning class or somebody else's deep learning class, you can take a look at that information. All right, that is really all I had for you. Um, just to do our recap, the intuition is that this is a linear classifier, and it was originally based on an ad hoc iterative algorithm, but we can recast it as gradient descent when we replace the 0-1 loss of the bang-bang threshold that uh, a perceptron has with a hinge loss, which is a more relaxed, more gentle loss function, which is therefore differentiable, okay? Or at least partially differentiable. So a hinge loss does have that one point of discontinuity, but we can solve that by just arbitrarily setting that point of discontinuity to have a derivative of one. So perceptrons, single perceptrons, can't do the X or or other problems that are not linearly separable. So they were ignored and put in the garbage can of uh, research for like 15, 20 years. But they came back bigger and better than ever when a bunch of people like Rummel Hart and McClelland and uh, Jeff Hinton and Jan McCoon and so on and so forth all got together over the course of a few years and started to really work on them again and showed that multi-layer perceptrons using backpropagation and other tricks are indeed general function approximators, and they can be used for... Um, in the deep learning world nowadays, once you have some, a whole new bag of tricks, you can use giant amounts of data and train giant networks, and that is the end of our story up till today. So, the math is all, however, the same, right? We're going to write a gradient descent kind of thing, and that is going to be how we're going to uh, train neural networks. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful next few hours, and I will see you all again on Monday with uh, little bit uh, of logistic uh, regression, I think, is what's coming up next. Bye now.